Grand Budapest Hotel, uh, as I mentioned, this is a Wes Anderson film. If you were to watch all of Wes Anderson films, um, from his very first one, Bottle Rocket, all the way up to the Grand Budapest Hotel, you, you would notice that his films um, become more and more stylized as they go on. And another way to say it is they become less and less realistic looking. Um, one of the things that defines a Wes Anderson film um, is his use of color. Uh, he likes to work with um, like three color patterns or a, a color pattern made of three different colors. Grand Budapest Hotel loves pinks and blues is two of his main colors. Um, and uh, we see that obviously in this shot here. And essentially there are, there are three colors in this shot. You get the pinks and the blues and you have these warm kind of brown beige earth tones. Um, this, this is a very deliberate choice on the cinematographer's part and on Wes Anderson's part. Um, you know, when we go through life, we are, we, we exist, we, we are surrounded by, by all kinds of colors, um, on a daily basis or, you know, um, it's not just three, but in Wes Anderson movies, the characters exist among three colors pretty much. Um, so it's not realistic, right? Um, there's, there's, uh, almost a, a kind of story-like or I almost want to say fairy tale quality to to Wes Anderson's movies in terms of the visual style and and this kind of goes along with the tone of the movies his movies are they don't they're not very serious films they don't take themselves seriously um, the the storylines and, and the characters are are complex um, you know and, and, and the characters are very human and they have you know these 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 very human dilemmas that they're going through but they're lighthearted oftentimes um, and, and comical. And so the, the visual style of the film helps to evoke that kind of lightheartedness. Now, we can contrast those two movies with, with these films. Um, Saving Private Ryan here, a World War II film, um, this has a much, much different visual feel, um, different kind of cinematography than... Um, either of these two films here. Okay, Grand Budapest Hotel, full of um, very rich colors, uh, kind of hits you over the head with its brightness here, contrasted here with the dull, um, kind of faded greens and blues and grays of Saving Private Ryan. Um, this was not an accident, okay? This is a war movie. This is a, a movie that takes itself very seriously. It's a very serious topic, and some of these scenes are incredibly hard to watch um and so the muted colors and the kind of grittiness of the film itself and oftentimes you get especially in this opening sequence here this is the invasion of normandy um handheld camera shots the camera is very shaky i think all of this is intended to kind of bring a, a sort of realism um to to the film um, as if we're watching a war take place right in front of our eyes, and it's not pretty. Um, it, it's, 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 it's really grim, right? So the visual tone of the cinematography um, kind of mirrors the, the emotional tone um, and the seriousness of, of the film itself. Same thing here with District 9. This is not a realistic film. It's a science fiction film, um, Kind of the aftermath of, of of an alien invasion in South Africa, um, and so it's not realistic, but it is. You do kind of see um, some washed out colors here, um, and uh, and and some of this film actually is um, is recorded on like handheld video cameras. It's kind of got a, like a found footage um, um, element to it. Uh, not all of it, but 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 some of it, and that's that's also deliberate. That was a deliberate choice of the cinematographer um, to shoot in this way, uh, to use color and lighting, um, and uh, and and certain kinds of film stock in this way. Again, to to kind of try to present something that's realistic, like we're watching news footage. Um, um, so they're going, they're 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 trying to match the the you know the tone of the story and the, the ideas of the story, the purpose of the story, with the visual um, tone of the, of the cinematography. Um, <clears throat> the cinematographer has to make a lot of decisions. Um, number one, where to put the camera? Where, you know, should the camera uh, be close to the, to the human subject? Should they, be, should they be far away? 
cinematographers oftentimes don't use zoom if they want to get close to something they'll move literally move the camera close to it or move it far away if they want to um, kind of uh, take in more of the of the scene um, so th the position of the camera the range of the camera um, is, is a big decision there also um, how to angle the camera do they do they want to put the camera above the subject kind of looking down on them or do they move it low looking up um, just for a couple of examples um, should they move the camera modern films um, you'll 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 probably notice this more when we look at, at camera movement but um, in, in movies today, cameras are moving all the time, moving fast, moving slow. They're moving in or out. They're moving from side to side, um, up or down. I mean, they're moving in all kinds of ways. And, and usually the way the camera moves is a very deliberate choice. And it's, and it's oftentimes used to enhance what's happening in that particular scene or that, that particular shot um, in terms of emotions and so forth. So um, we'll get more into that. And then lastly, of course, the, the composition of, a, of, a, of, of the actual image on the screen, like the photograph, and then the lighting. This is where you're going to see a lot of overlap with photography. So um, we're going to, you know, again, a cinematographer probably has a lot more decisions to make than just these four things, but we're, we're um, I'm kind of simplifying this and breaking it down into these four, um, these four categories. So uh, tomorrow's lesson will be on camera range. A few more basic terms here to cover. Um, the first is frame. We're going to be talking a lot about frames. Uh, frame is kind of the most basic unit of a film. Um, one definition of a frame is this. It's literally uh, a single image on a strip of film. Um, it used to be that all, all movies were on actual film stock, pieces of film. Okay, um, Actually, old, old photographs used to be taken on um, rolls of film like this and so a single photograph would come from a single frame nowadays in digital film um, it's not like this but um, that was that's one definition of a frame would be li literally one um, one photograph uh, of, of a shot in a movie um, when we talk about frame we're going to usually um, use the second definition or we'll mean the second definition here which which is simply the the edges of the image um, that we see either when we're looking through the camera in the viewfinder or when um, when we see it on the screen okay so um, everything that is within the boundaries um, of that of that screen um, and uh, and and this is going to be before we'll talk about why this is important in just a sec but um, a couple things will will um, will determine what's in the frame one is the camera what type of camera is used um, an IMAX an IMAX camera has a much bigger frame. It can get, it can get a lot more in, in, in it, and the IMAX film itself can contain more in the frame. Um, if you're shooting for TV, you're going to get much less within that frame. Um, so the type of camera and the type of screen that it's going to be shown on uh, may determine what, what ends up being within that frame um, or not. Um, the other thing that determines, too, is uh, uh, how, how close that camera is or far away from the, the subject that it's shooting. Um, this, is, this is not a, a movie, this is a, a photograph, but I'm gonna use this as an example. This is a very famous photograph from the 1930s, from the Dust Bowl era, called Migrant Mother. And you're probably familiar with this photograph here on the right. This is the one that made the photographer famous here. Um, Dorothy Lang was the photographer, and um, what the backstory of this is she was, she was driving around um, looking for for um, opportunities to, to photograph here and she came across this migrant camp this camp of migrant farmers um, and uh, and she started taking pictures and she started she started taking pictures of this family here um, I assume it's a family um, in their in their encampment in their tent and uh, uh, she started kind of from far away okay so in this image the frame the four walls here of our image they hold a lot of information, okay? Obviously in the center we have our human subjects, but then we also see their tent in its entirety, okay? Um, we see there are a few possessions here, um, kind of a broken down old rocking chair that this, this uh, person is sitting on. We see the dirt that they're living in, right? So we kind of get the sense of the, the, the poverty and the squalor here, the dirt and the tent. We see the, the background, the trees and the sky. There's a lot of visual um, visual information in within this frame here 
Now she started, Lang started getting closer and closer to the subject. She moved her camera closer and watch what happens. There's less visual information, okay? We still get some tree and sky, but not as much as we had before. We get some of the tent, but we don't get the whole tent, right? We see some dirt, but not all the dirt. We see, um, maybe a, we, we get a little bit closer, we can see a couple of possessions here, but we don't get kind of all of it, okay? So as the camera gets closer, the frame kind of shrinks in terms of, of what kind of information is contained within the frame, okay? More of that information here gets pushed outside of the frame. Now we get to the final photograph here, the most famous photograph, and um, now there's there's really very little visual information. I shouldn't say very little, but um, in terms of physical information, there's there's really only the people. Okay, we see the the tent, but it's not really in focus. We don't see the the dirt. We don't see the sky. We don't see any of the surrounding stuff. What we do see is the mother's face. We see the children turned away, kind of an embarrassment or fear. And we see this look of concern, deep worry, um, like an existential worry on her face. And of course, this is enhanced by the position of her hand um, on her chin. This is what Lang was going for, okay? The difference between this photograph here and this photograph is that um, this photograph here tells us more, we get more information about the woman's um, emotional experience um, in here, we get more information about the uh, uh, kind of physical reality of their life. Okay, so we know this one kind of um, captures their poverty, but this one captures the human element of their struggle. And that's because the frame cuts all of this stuff out, and it only contains um, the, the, the human beings and their reactions. Okay, our last two terms here, um, we're gonna be talking a lot about this one, the shot, okay? For, um, for the next couple of weeks, everything we look at will basically be, um, we're gonna be talking about shots, okay? A shot is a single continuous uncut series of frames. So you know like when the director says action and then they say cut, um, everything that happens between action and cut, that's a shot, okay? Um, now, when, you, when the editor gets a hold of, of, of the film, um, then they might cut that shot um, and put them together uh, to form a scene. Um, this, a scene would be a continuous action that takes place within a, a specific location or time frame, usually the same location or, or, or the same time frame. Um, so let's, let's take a look at, at a couple of examples of these. Um, the first one here, this is, this is one of the earliest examples of a, of a movie that tells a story. Okay, this is um, a 1903 short film. Well, all the films were short, but a 1903 um, film called *The Great Train Robbery*. Very, very famous film. Um, the uh, the director here was Edwin S. Porter, and this this is one of the the first films to tell a story. Prior to this, uh, you know, people were so wowed by the technology that they almost didn't care what they watched. They could watch. Uh, a, a bunch of workers leaving a factory and it would be impressive. They watched horses on a racetrack. They watched, um, you know, a, a couple kissing uh, and, and, and that was impressive because the technology was new but they quickly, they quickly got bored with that and they wanted stories and this was one of the first films that actually told a story. Um, but what you're gonna see here is that um, uh, there were some limitations. The cameras at this time were so big and clunky that they, they were not easy to move. And so essentially what they had to do is they put a camera in front of or within a, within a, 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 a room or um, and sometimes they actually mounted it on the train. But it, once they put the camera there, it was stuck. And so if, if they wanted to film a scene, basically they had to, um, that, that whole scene had to unfold within that one particular location because they couldn't really move the camera easily. Okay, so let's watch, watch this. I'll let this play and, and kind of talk over it. This is our first scene. It takes place within, I think, the, the, the telegraph office here. Um, and our two train robbers here are trying to um, make sure that this guy doesn't alert the authorities and, and communicates with the train as if everything's normal because they, they just want to you know, board the train and rob it. So here they're hiding out. 
train conductor is going to come in here on the left. Yep, get his get his orders. Um, and these guys are going to tie up. Yep, then we're going to knock out our uh, telegraph operator and uh, and tie him up. This is a scene. This is the first scene, and you can see it's one shot. The camera is um, the camera's in one position because it can't move, and uh, and it's almost like we're watching this play out on stage in a theater, right? Early films were like this. It was like, um, you know, every every scene was a different stage. Uh, and it's going to cut here to the next scene, which is also the next shot, which is outside the telegraph office. There it is. Yeah. So again, the camera has moved, right, to get this next shot. And then this, the entirety of this scene will play out in one shot. I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. So, uh, and I'm, we're not going to watch the whole thing together, but, uh, um, okay, same shot, same scene, camera moves just a little bit, just a little bit to, pans to the right a little bit, but couldn't really do much more than that. Okay. All right, next shot, next scene. We're inside one of the train cars, that's where all the money is. Oh, here they come. The guys trying to lock up the safe before they come in. Our robbers come in, they have a shootout. Very dramatic death, as was the way with silent films. So you guys get the idea. Um, early films had to had to um, because of the, the the limitations of the technology. Every scene was a single shot. Okay. Next shot, mounted on the train. Kind of cool. Okay. The Great Train Robbery was, I think, the first Western film ever made. This is a much more recent Western. This is The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. This is a, um, a, a film that's actually made of several short films. If you haven't seen this, you really should check it out. This is, I, I think, on Netflix. Um, this is made by the Coen brothers, Joel and Ethan Coen, who are two of my most favorite directors. Um, we're going to watch more from them um, later in the class. Um, I'm going to show you part of the opening scene of this film so you can kind of see how this contrasts with the Great Train Robbery. Okay, So this scene opens up with this shot here. We call this um, an extreme long shot or an establishing shot. We'll talk more about this later on. Um, but you can see there's a lot of visual information here. Okay, um, Our character is just pulling up on his horse to this cantina, which is located in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Now, this is shot number two. Okay, so with the same scene, this is all action that's taking place within the same specific place and time, but now the camera's inside the building. Okay, we have a shot of our main character here. Ah, shot number two. This is a reaction shot from the, from the uh, outlaws inside the cantina. And then we get us... Um, medium close-up here. This is shot number four. Medium close-up of our, our, our main character who's got this super goofy look on his face. Um, and this is part of the comedy of the film too. So um, he's reacting to them. They're reacting to him. Their reactions are very, very different. Oops. Okay, well, you get the idea. Um, so uh, modern films are like this. A, a single scene will be made up of lots and lots of shots. Okay, um, whereas in early cinema, um, very early cinema, single scenes were often just one continuous shot. Okay, well next up is our um, is going to be uh, uh, our lesson on camera range. You can expect this tomorrow. We're going to be talking about um, different uh, proximities um, between the camera and um, the the stuff that it's shooting, and um, and 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 why those matter.